Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Anyone who lives in New York City is used to seeing people with noticeable mental health issues. They're on the subway and on the buses, on the streets and in the movie houses. Quite a few New Yorkers are swimming uphill, facing profound challenges trying to navigate the everyday concerns of life. And let's face it, most of us try to avoid them. But Carla Rabinowitz confronts them each day. Her full-time job is to advocate for their safety, for their access to decent housing, education, jobs, and health care, and for the policies and financial resources that can make this happen. She's the advocacy coordinator for Community Access, a nonprofit that for more than 40 years has been in the forefront of efforts to improve the lives of individuals who are living with mental illness. And today, she'll tell us about what community access has accomplished and about the challenges that lie ahead. Carla, if most, if most New Yorkers are like me, they don't know very much about um, what kind of system is in place for housing and treating the mentally ill in New York City. You know, one time, there were state mental hospitals where patients went for long-term care. There were hospital psychiatric wards, like the one at, at Bellevue Hospital, which was notorious, at least for a while, where patients went for short-term care. At some point, however, I think it was in the 70s, the state started to deinstitutionalize many of the mentally ill, sending them to group homes or back home. Supposedly, there was going to be, there would be outpatient um, treatment available at public and private treatment facilities. But we know that this wasn't always there and that some of these people wound up on the streets or in jail. How would you describe the structure that's in place now and how well is it working? So Community Access is a 43-year-old nonprofit that empowers mental health recipients by providing quality housing and employment training. And there's something called supportive housing. And Community Access pioneered this model many, many years ago where we mix low-income families with mental health recipients in one building. In all the buildings Community Access builds, there's a community room, a computer room, a backyard, sometimes a garden. There's free access to adopt a pet. It's a holistic approach to the mental health problem. So first get somebody into housing, get them a permanent place to live. They have a lifelong lease. And then wrap services around them. And that's called supportive housing. Now, there are different levels. There's transitional housing for people who need more supports. But the vast majority of people who are homeless and live with mental health really need a decent home and the support That's the priority. Number That's the priority. priority. And the problem right, it is right now, there just is not enough housing. There's approximately 80,000 homeless across the state, about 40 to 75 Homeless, 80,000 homeless altogether. altogether. They, yep. Okay. About 40% to 75% of the adults are people with mental health concerns. And right now, we're pushing the governor to release, there's about $1.9 billion in money for supportive housing. Um, $1.9 billion for housing in New York State, about a billion for supportive housing. But it's tied up in this simple contract that um, the governor, leader of Senate, and leader of Assembly have to put together. And if they would just sign this simple contract, we'd immediately get 6,000 new apartments for people. In New York City? Yeah, but, you know, they're playing politics, and so they're holding up this billion dollars for housing, and that 6,000 would help. Now, when uh, Community Access was founded in 1974, was it in response to the deinstitutionalization de that you had all these people coming out of mental hospitals and you needed... Ha they needed housing and they needed support? Yes, you seem to know more than me. Yes, it was the families of people, and they got together and they bought up a small building. Um, but what we have now is so much better. Um, we have community access, has supportive services to everybody in the building who has a permanent lease. And these support staff are not just people off the street in college. They go through a very extensive core training on how to treat people with mental health concerns, uh, how to help people to reach their goals. There's so many services in the, in the building once you get in and you have, they have a permanent lease. I mean, they can't be kicked out. They're tenants like anywhere else, but they have career services. They have access to adopt a pet if they want. And they have 
so many services that you just can't imagine. And that's what keeps people from going into homelessness again. Right. You give now, them you, now, you talked about how, you know, there, there's a big homeless problem in general in New York City, whether you have mental issues or not. Um, you've got uh, families and individuals who need housing. You've got veterans, you know, who are um, need housing and supportive services. Is it and the city is scrambling trying to meet that need or maybe not scrambling enough. Is it easier? Um, well, I guess I want to ask the question, do you have any idea of how many uh, mentally ill homeless there are in New York City? Yeah, just about probably, so they say the low end is 40, uh, there's 60,000 homeless in New York City. They say 40 percent it would be about, well, let's say it's 50%, about 30,000 okay. in New York City. Okay. That's the low end. Okay. So that's a lot. Okay, that is a lot. My understanding is that the city is legally required to provide certain services for the mentally ill and that community access was in part responsible for, for making that a mandate. Uh, I have to say that's beyond my okay. knowledge. Okay. Uh, I do know that um, there is a right to shelter for people, but even that is not being followed. You know, I work in in housing and in trying to get more funding for permanent housing, which I think is the answer. But I get calls from all over the city, and the number one call I get is people facing eviction or people in shelters, and they're in shelters and. Uh, the shelter staff is not applying for the, going through the housing process they need. There's violence in shelters. It's just, shelters are not a solution to permanent housing. And I think often in the neighborhoods, people get confused between shelters and permanent housing. Mm -hmm. So when Community Access wants to build a beautiful building in the Bronx, um, people in the neighborhood don't want the building to come in because they think it's a shelter. They don't understand, no, this is permanent housing with lots of supports. And um, they're beautiful buildings, the ones we build. And peop you know, police in the area usually come to us and talk to us because we have cameras all around. We have a nice lobby. Mm -hmm. um, but people get confused between the shelter and permanent housing and right. supportive housing. Now, you currently operate 18 housing uh, sites. Uh, home to, is it 1,500, 1,500 individuals and families? Okay, according to your website. Um, where, my sense is that uh, you have a number of them on the uh, Lower East Side of Manhattan. You have some in the Bronx. Uh, other places? In, you have any? Couple in Brooklyn. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so, what, you, you, and you talked about the kinds of services that they offer. Do they differ uh, in character and, or in terms of services or in terms of who lives there? Are they all pretty much the same? So our permanent housing that we build are pretty much the same. We have that front desk, receptionists, the services. We have the program directors and the deputy program directors who are in charge of making sure there's services for everybody who wants it. If you don't want services, that's fine. But if you want services, that there are services there. Then there's, and, and the people in our permanent housing, they hold lifelong leases, just like you or me in a rent-stabilized apartment. It's their place. Now the transitional housing is different. There are people coming out of long-term hospital stays or coming out of long-term shelter stays that aren't yet adjusted to living on their own, and they need a lot more supports. So there's going to be a lot more supports in those places. Um, when you talk about support, are we talking about social workers? Are we talking about psychologists, psychiatrists? What are we talking about? You're talking about um, employees of community access who've gone through our core training on how to be, on how to help people with mental health concerns. And so that's who, who does it. They're not, they don't necessarily have to be a psychologist. They don't even necessarily have to have a college degree, although we sometimes prefer college degrees. It's just have to have the right attitude, have to be caring towards person. Community access, we believe people are the experts in their own recovery. And so they have to have that right attitude. They have to allow people the right to fail at a task. 
not say, oh, this is this, they can't do this. So there's a lot of core training that goes on to community access, specific to community access, training of the staff to get them to, to better interact with people with mental health concerns. Now, in your housing, are we talking about um, single rooms? Are we talking about studio apartments? Are we talking about full-size, one-bedroom? What are we talking about? So everything, all of the above, right? In the transitional housing, some buildings, one building they share, in most buildings they have their own room. Transitional housing, they have a lot of support, so they cook the meals together and things like that. There's a few of those. In the permanent housing, all the housing, most housing in the Bronx is permanent housing. People have their own rooms. It differs. In Manhattan, it's a studio. In Brooklyn, it's a bigger apartment. And then we, we pioneered the model of mixing people with mental health concerns with low-income families. So you'll have the low-income family apartments, which are usually you know, two, two three-bedroom apartments with people with mental health concerns. Okay, okay. Um, tell me about, uh, so let's talk about some of your residences. Uh, Governor Court, you transformed a hospital into supportive houses That's on the, uh, uh, the Lower East Side. I think I've actually been there a long time ago. Okay. Tell me about that. It is probably one of my favorite buildings, Gouverneur Court. Um, they have an art space in the building, so we have uh, paid artists there, and people create art of all different types, and they teach you know, art. And um, they've had some up on our website for Christmas, some beautiful paintings and such. The building itself is wonderful. Um, it is a real community at Gouverneur Court. The apartments are small. Um, and that one is mostly mental health, people with mental health concerns, some people with HIV. Um, and it has a beautiful, beautiful kitchen, a really big kitchen. And we have cooks. So at that building, they serve dinner every night. I think it's $1.50 for like a fantastic meal. They have a very strong tenants group. So uh, one of the things we were working on was getting like a stoplight in front of the building. We're still working on that. But the tenants are very like united. So like if there's, like in every building, there's one tenant or something who's acting up. They'll rally around each other, these tenants. And they'll, you know, they'll call me all the time. They'll call someone else till something is done. Really till proactive. the building is right. Yeah. Okay. It's a really strong tenant group there. Okay. We're going to have to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Carla Rabinowitz of Community Access after the following message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Carla Rabinowitz, Advocacy Coordinator for Community Access, a nonprofit that's helping to improve the lives of New Yorkers living with mental health issues. Police interaction, you know, obviously housing is, you know, as you said, stable housing, supportive housing is a big priority uh, for people who are having mental health issues. Uh, police interaction with the mentally ill has been a, an issue over the years. I mean, you call 911 because your 40-year-old uh, son is threatening other family members. You hope the police are going to come, calm him down, make him maybe take him to some place where he can get help. The police come and they wind up shooting him and he's dead. Um, but this is an area that you guys have been proactive in, correct? Yes, uh, four years ago we started a coalition called the CCITNYC.org. Um, we got together and we got 75 organizations together. What does that stand for, by the way? Communities for Crisis Intervention Teams in New York City. Okay. And the whole goal was to get the city to a top, a crisis intervention team model, which is a way of policing that improves the interactions with people with mental health concerns. And three years ago, the mayor got on board, and he said, okay, we're going to hold some task force. We're going to bring the NYPD in. This is de Blasio. De Blasio. Okay. A year and a half ago, the NYPD, we convinced them, and they started doing some training of officers. So the whole thing is that when police respond, they do command and control. They mean they shout at people, you know, drop the butter knife, hands on your head, drop to the floor. If you're in crisis, that just doesn't work. If you're in a mental health crisis, you don't even know those are the police. You're so unaware. 
And so what uh, CIT is, it's a way of training officers so they de-escalate the crisis. And they've been doing a good job for the last year and a half in terms of training the officers and de-escalation, a whole new way of, tr of, of, of training in defeating stigma in their classroom. Um, they do it 30 officers at a time. My problem is we don't have mayor, the mayor kind of left the scene. He kind of left it to the NYPD. We don't have the mayoral oversight now, and we need that because the police are now saying in their reports that they've trained like 4,800 or 5,000 officers. We did the math, and it doesn't add up. Um, they said they ha were, had 30 in a class, so we said, okay, let's put 35 in a class and start from June 1st and count the weeks, and we get 2,800. Out of how many cops altogether? Out of 36,000. Okay. 36,000. So we need some mayoral oversight on what the police are doing. And also, I gather that, you know, if you have a, a crisis situation with a mentally ill person, the police who respond are not necessarily police who have been trained. That is correct, and that is the other real great problem. We need the 911 operators trained, and we need some way of getting these newly trained, they're great, the newly trained officers are great, these 3,000 officers, we need to get them to the crisis calls like they do in other cities. Otherwise, they're just walking the beat. And if they run into a crisis, they do. And if they don't, they don't. So, and, then, and the other thing is we need, we need more training. We need to get this. Commissioner Bratton, for whatever other problems he had, really believed in CIT training. And we need to get this commissioner to buy into the same thing. The these, these CIT training, it can't be just 3,000 officers. We need 15,000 officers trained. Okay. So you're the advocacy coordinator. So obviously this is one of the things that you are better training, more training, uh, getting the trained officers to the, the crisis sites. That's obviously uh, one thing that you have been advocating for. What are some of the other things, uh, policy changes or whatever that you've been advocating for? Um, with the police or with other matters? What, with other matters. Okay. So... Um so two things, you know, this New York, New York 4 campaign, trying to get the $1.9 billion released for housing. Every Wednesday we're at the governor's office, 40th and 3rd, 9 o'clock, every Wednesday. Come and join us as we rally the governor to release the funding for supportive housing. Do you know why it hasn't been released? Politics. Politics. Okay. Politics. Okay. Um, the other thing, we do some fun stuff, too. We have a mental health film festival every year. Yeah, tell me about that. So it's 14 years old. Uh, it's one of the first film fests in the U United States. And um, it started with the mental health community, and we had some ragtag films, and it's more of a food fest than a film fest. And then we got into this big theater in um, the Lower East Side, and now we get films from... Last year we had films from... Australia, from Africa, Canada, all over. We had Tasha Smith from Empire come do a film. We had Shamika Holtzclaw, a WNBA star. The whole point of the Film Fest is to defeat stigma by bringing together mental health recipients and people who just love great films. Mm -hmm. And last year, we just had such an array of people who are just film goers. 50% of the people at the Film Fest had no mental health concerns. It's just Do a the great films film fest. deal with mental yes, issues? Yes, all the films deal with mental health. Some are very positive. We like to give people hope, like Shamika Holtzclaw, who's a WNBA star. She lives with mental health. Her film was there. And some just touch on the issue but and are when funny. Is, when is the festival? What, what time is it? It's going to be October, 2000, um, October 2017, and you can go to mentalhealthfilmfest.nyc or go to the community access website. And, um, you know, we, we say we only we get a lot of submissions. If the film doesn't make you laugh or cry, it's not in our film fest. These okay. are not preachy films. These are just great films from all over. Okay. Um, some of your other programs, um, you sort of mentioned the pet adoption program. Tell me about that. So there are a couple of things that make community access really unique. First of all, our CEO, Steve Coe, really cares about people. He just loves people. He'll talk to everybody. And he, he's, he accepts all these new innovative programs that you bring up to him. So the Pet Access is one of those programs. And Pet Access was started by a person who loved her pets. And so for people who are financially strapped living in our housing, we'll help them if, 
we'll help them to get a pet. We'll pay for the cost of adoption. We'll pay for a year of veterinary costs. We'll pay for a trainer to come in if they're having any problems. Now the people have to apply and show us, yes, they do have the money and they do have the ability to care for a pet. We have cats, dogs, birds, um, you name it, we have it. And the whole point is that sometimes people with mental health concerns get isolated. And having a pet is a great way to socialize with someone else. Your neighbor comes in and sees your cat. You take your dog for a walk. And instantly a conversation starts. And it helps a person socially. And we have found that the people who are living with pets are less likely to be hospitalized because they have someone to care for. Sounds like a great idea. You also have art workshops. Tell me about those. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, an art space in one of our buildings in Gouverneur Court. Um, and the art program, as we said, we pay for an artist to work there. People work on everything. There are some really great artists. If you go to our website and go to the art space, you can see some things for sale. Everything from really great natural artists to people who've been trained who are doing their best. Um, and it's just another way of making sure that people who want to... Um, people who want to do some good things in their lives can do something instead of just sitting around. Yeah. We also have an, um, a career service unit where they go out to the sites all the time and they try to get people into going back to work. I or would think that would be a big challenge, getting jobs for... Uh, well, getting jobs is a big challenge for everybody right. these days. <laughs> but it starts with people wanting to get to work, and that's, you know, a career service helps in all sorts of capacities, from putting resumes together to encouraging the person to having workshops on work. So community access comes with a lot of services. Okay. What in initiatives, mental health initiatives, do you want to, do you see, are, are you really interested in pushing forward in the future? <sighs> initiatives in the for future, I mean, this CIT thing is two steps forward, one step back. We were meeting with the deputy commissioner and it was all going good. And then I think maybe I'm wrong, maybe the change in commissioner, I don't know. But I've been noticing lately they're getting more pushback. Like at first they wanted to train every officer they could and now not so much. And this is very critical to me because do you know that a thousand people are killed by the police in 2016? And half of those were people with mental health concerns. A thousand people? A thousand, yeah. 2016 was a really high year. Um, and 500 were people with mental health concerns. So it's a great concern to me. Also, I want people with mental health concerns to be able to call the police when something happens. You know, I've gone to the police with people in our buildings, and they say, I'm sorry, we can't take the report. They have a psychiatric disability. I mean, that's, that's terrible. And... I know progress is being made, but we really got to stay on this with the police, and we really, we need to bridge the gap between the police and the mental health community. Okay, I see that's a big issue for you. Yeah. We've got about a minute left. You were trained as a lawyer. You have practiced law. What drew you to be an advocate for the mentally ill and brought you to community access in particular? Um, well, I mean, I've always loved advocacy and everything I did in life, um, you know, um, and um, it's a perfect fit. I get to be around people who are in different states of mental health recovery. So every day I see kind of sometimes what not to do, you know. Uh, and sometimes I see what to do from people that I'm around. I'm an organizer of a lot of people in the mental health community. And I really learn from them and I love helping them. Okay. Um, so if I'm a person with a history of mental illness and I'm living day to day in homeless shelters, where should I go for help? You can always call me at Community Access, and I can um, refer you to the right resources. Okay. Um, it sounds like a very um, rewarding area of work. It is. Probably not one you, you anticipated doing, but, you know, we all sort of follow what comes up and really appeals to us. Right. Okay. Okay. Has Sherlane McRae, the, the mayor's wife, has been an advocate for those with mental illness, I think because of her daughter has had some issues. Has that had any tangential benefits for yes, you? Yes, tremendous. I mean, the mayor and his wife are great advocates. 
They've come up with something called NYC Well, 888 NYC Well, where people from all over can call in and get mental health help. Um, they've come up with something called Thrive NYC, where there's a new like employment training program a couple of hours a day, a couple of hours, a couple of times a week. Um, the mayor and his wife have done great things through um, NYC Well, 188 NYC Well, if you're in emotional distress. Okay. Very interesting. And it's uh, a subject that I haven't heard talked about in a long time. So I'm glad that I was able to have this conversation with you today. We're out of time. I want to thank Carla Rabinowitz for joining me. For more information about Community Access and all its services, you can go to its website at communityaccess.com. Dot org. You'll find information on the film festival as well. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.